This is the first night of the Rock Counts Workshop, and I don't know what to expect. Okay, so while you are grabbing out those rocks, I'm going to get started talking a little bit about the origin of the solar system. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you guys. So before I want to get started, I want to lay some ground rules. Firstly, not everything that I'm covering is going to be covered in the Science Olympiad event. I'm going to use a lot of big words. I'm going to you know, give you lots of extra information that really you don't need. But it's things that I want you to hear and be exposed to. Um, so if I'm going way over your head, I apologize. If you guys are really lost, stop and, and bring me back and I'll try and explain things better. Um, Additionally, I'm going to make sure that all of these PowerPoints are posted on the Macomb webpage, so I don't need to see any parents out there frantically taking notes or taking pictures. Um, we will get all this online, so don't worry about that. Um, so be before we can start talking about rocks, I'd like to talk about where it all started. So in the beginning, before our solar system was formed, there was gas and dust and other particles that were floating out in space and gravity started to bring them together and eventually it started swirling into this disk powered by gravity and more and more mass came together, more stuff and eventually the sun lit and you know caught fire, created the heat source that it now is. Um, that blew away all the other dust and the planets themselves formed together in this disk going around the, the sun. This isn't particularly important to the Science Olympiad event, but um, Earth itself is in a really what we call a special zone, the Goldilocks zone. Just like the story with the porridge, not too hot, not too cold, right? Um, Earth is right in that perfect little range where it's warm enough for life. We have liquid, solid, and vaporous water here on our planet. Um, and that makes our planet dynamic and active. So our planet is much more changing than most of the other planets. So the Earth itself, the Earth is made of a number of layers. The middle of it is the core, which some people, depending on who we talk to, will break it down into the inner core and the outer core. Um, but there's a core in the middle. Outside of that is the mantle, which is the most of it. And then the very outer edge of our planet is the crust. And the crust is super thin when you look at the scale of how big Earth is. The Earth is huge, and the crust is just this tiny little skin on the outside. To put it into perspective, it's the same thickness as when you cut an apple in half. The thickness of the skin on that apple is the same thickness of, as the crust is on the Earth. So it's just a teeny little layer, but that crust is where everything that we deal with in geology is done. All the rocks, all the minerals are in that crust and on that crust. So that's what we're dealing with here. How do we know what's on the inside of the earth? Has anybody ever drilled to the center of the earth? Does anybody know? Have we ever drilled down there? No, no, no right? Like there was a movie years ago, Journey to the Center of the Earth. No way can't happen. There's too much pressure in there. So how do we know? How do we know what's inside of there? What we do is we record how earthquakes reflect. They actually reflect off of these different zones and different parts of inside the earth, the mantle and the core. They, the earthquake vibrations, they bounce off and in different parts of the earth we can read them and see them and put together a map knowing that the earth is made of different things on the inside, different layers. So how deep have we gotten? The deepest mine on the planet is the Tautana Gold Mine. It's in South Africa. 2.4 miles deep, which is nothing when you think about how huge the Earth is, right? Um, and it is so deep that the mantle, the, the inner hot part of the Earth, is heating up the, the walls of the mine. It's 140 degrees Fahrenheit on the wall, so the workers have to wear these crazy suits so they don't burn themselves just to touch the wall on the mine. Um, but to put it into perspective, it's, it's nothing compared to the, the depth of the earth, and that's as far down as we've ever gone. 
So how does the earth work? The earth works with plate tectonics is what we call it. Okay, so there are these floating plates of rock on the outside of the earth that are being pulled and dragged around by these convection cells inside the mantle. Which convection, have you guys ever watched a pot of water when it boils on the stove, if you make some noodles? The, the water comes up the sides and then goes back down the middle, the bubbles. They go up and down and around. That's basically the same thing that the, the mantle does. The mantle has these convection cells that go up and down and they slowly drag the plates and they push them into each other and they pull them apart depending on where they are in these convection cells. Um, so there's two different you know, areas where these plates meet. When they come and crash together, we call that a convergent boundary. That's what builds mountains. Okay, it makes some interesting rocks. When they're pulled apart, that's a divergent boundary. That largely happens at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and that makes different types of rocks. So certain rocks, we can tell that they, if they were formed near a convergent or a divergent boundary. So when we think of igneous rocks, we largely think of volcanoes, right? There's lots of different types of volcanoes, and they give us different rocks. Um, what makes, yes, you have a question? No? OK. Um, so what makes these volcanoes different is the type of melted rock that's inside of there. Um, does anybody know what we call melted rock? What do we call melted rock? Magma. That's a really good answer. Or lava, that's right. So both of those were correct answers. But inside the earth, it's mantle. Inside the earth is the mantle, yes. When it's inside the earth, that liquid rock, we call magma. When it's outside of the earth, we call it lava. Um, it's basically, they're both words for melted rock. So depending on the minerals that are melted in these rocks, um, it gives us different types of volcanoes. So there's like really slow volcanoes like Hawaii that just kind of leak out that liquid magma that you could, you could walk away from. You don't have to worry about it getting you. And then there's other volcanoes like when Mount St. Helens blew up that are explosive and violent and they boom, you know. And those have something to do with the magma type. So these magma types, we break them down into three different groups which the middle one is just an in-between one, so you almost don't have to count it. Um, when they're light colored, we call that a granitic or a felsic magma. Those are both terms that you kind of should know. That generally means these light colored rocks. Almost all of them are light colored. They have quartz in them, they have feldspars, they have mica. Um, they're light colored. Granitic, what, does that sound like any rock anybody's ever heard of? What rock? Granite. granite, right? Okay, so granite is like the perfect granitic rock. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we've got dark magmas. These magmas are like what we see in Hawaii, right? They're basaltic magmas or mafic. Mafic and basaltic are the same thing. Um, the, so these ones actually make real violent volcanoes. These ones make pretty slow volcanoes. Um, so the mafic ones, they're dark colored, there's biotype mica, there's lots of feldspars. There's not very much quartz. That's the one thing that you need to know with, with the mafics. Um, now then there's in-between ones. We call them intermediates or andesitic is another word. Andesite is another rock. Um, so these intermediates, they're kind of half and half. A lot of times they're salt and pepper is a word that I use to, to try and remember it. They're sort of, they have features of both. So there's one way that we separate igneous rocks when we classify them. And this is based on where they were at when they cooled from that liquid rock into a solid rock. Some of the rocks cooled underneath the ground and some of them cooled above the ground. So that's how we separate them. 
The ones that cooled inside the ground, we call them intrusive. It cooled inside the earth. Those are intrusive. The ones that cooled outside of the earth, we call extrusive. Okay, they have some feature differences that I'll tell you about in just a sec. So the biggest feature that you can tell the difference is the size of the crystals. When something cools in the earth, it takes a long time. So it's enough time for these crystals to grow bigger. They take time to, to make these crystals. So pretty much in, in most intrusive rocks, you can see the crystals just from looking at it. You don't need a magnifying glass or a microscope. You can see these crystals with your naked eye. When they cool outside of the earth, the, it cools so fast it doesn't give a chance for the crystals to grow very big at all. You need a microscope to really see them. So um, there's two different words that we use to, to define those. When you can see the crystals, we call that phaneritic. Phaneritic means you can see those crystals with your naked eye. When you can't see the crystals, we call that aphanitic. Aphanitic means you can't see the crystals. There's another feature that we look at when we look at igneous rocks. It's whether or not it has bubbles in it. The bubbles, they usually are formed from these dissolved gases that were dissolved inside the liquid rock. Just like when you take a soda pop and you shake it up and all the bubbles come out of it, that CO2 was dissolved inside the water, inside the soda pop. Um, there's lots of dissolved gases that are dissolved inside the liquid rock. And depending on how it came out of the earth, sometimes that those gases were coming out as the rock was cooling. So that gives us bubbles and holes that you can see inside the rock. Um, the term that we use for those bubbles is vesicles. So when a rock has lots of bubbles, we say it's vesicular, vesicles. So to get into the rocks that we're going to talk about, we first have the rocks that have been on the list for years. Basalt, scoria, pumice, obsidian, and granite. Now this year, just special for this year, we added three rocks and three minerals. So the three rocks that we added for this year are igneous rocks. And they're diorite, gabbro, and rhyolite. So I'm going to talk about each one of these rocks. First one I'm going to talk about is basalt. So if everybody could grab your sample of basalt, it'll be labeled 6B. I want you to take a look at it. Now every year when we get these kits, some of the samples look a little bit different. So your sample may or may not look exactly like I'm describing. Would you say, raise your hand if you would say that your sample of basalt looks dark. It's a dark color. Okay, so most of you, it should be dark. Does anybody have any bubbles or vesicles in your sample? If you do, raise your hand. All right, so there's a few, right? We can see a few people do have a sample that has a bubble or a vesicle in it. Basalt sometimes has these vesicles, but it usually doesn't. Um, can anybody see any crystals in their sample? I see some of you can. For the few of you who can, would you say that they're pretty big or you have to look pretty hard to see them? Has somebody tell me. You have to look kind of hard. How about yours? They're pretty small too. Usually that's how it is. Usually you can't see them. Sometimes you can, but they're pretty small when they're in there. It's unusual to see a crystal that you would call pretty big in a piece of basalt. Now basalt is an extrusive igneous rock. That means that it cooled where? Where did it cool? Can somebody tell me? Where did it cool? Outside. You're right. So igneous basalt is an extrusive igneous rock. It cooled outside the earth. It can cool in actually kind of two different places. One is on the land in a volcano. So that would be like the Hawaiian volcanoes. Like this picture here. Um, you guys have all seen these you know, movies or videos of Hawaii with the slow lava flows. That's basalt being made right in front of you. Now there's another place that basalt is commonly being made. It's at those divergent plate boundaries in the bottom of the ocean. So 
the, the magma or then lava that seeps out in the bottom of the ocean when the seafloor spreads generally makes basalt. It actually makes this a special kind of basalt we call pillow basalt because it cools in these little lumps. As it leaks out, it cools very quickly. And it, it looks funny. Sometimes you can actually find pieces. I was up in the UP once and found an outcropping of pillow basalt. So that was once at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it looks, and look, looks like these little lumps. Um, does anybody have any questions about basalt? Yes? Why does my sample have One sec. a tiny piece of white? Go ahead. Why does my sample have a tiny piece of white on it? Sometimes they have white. It could be from weathering. Often the white is from weathering. Um, it could be from other minerals that were leached onto it too. Another question. How do they get their name? All sorts of rocks and minerals have different origins for their name. I'm not sure where basalt's name came from. Another question. You asked if many pieces of basalt have inch-long crystals. Most of them don't. Most of them don't. It, it can happen. It's called porphyritic basalt. But most pieces don't. Yes? Go ahead. You. That's a great question, and I should actually back up entirely. He asked if there can be minerals inside basalt. And the answer to that is absolutely. Rocks are made up of minerals. That's what, what they are. They're a mixture of different minerals. So yes, there are minerals inside basalt. So I'm going to show you a few pieces of basalt that I brought. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. This is what you would probably find here in Michigan. It's rounded, maybe from the glaciers or from a river. It's almost black. You can't really see very many crystals in it. I'm sure you've all seen pieces like this at the beach. When you break it open, it sometimes has grayish or little sparkles to it, small mineral crystals that you can barely see. Sometimes other minerals or weather it. Um, makes it look lighter on the outside. Sometimes the crystals are a little bit bigger. If you had a, a magnifying glass, you could probably spot the minerals, the mineral crystals in this, but they're still very small. This is a piece I found in the UP, and it's got vesicles in it. It has holes, and some of them are filled with calcite, and some of them are filled with... Mm, Olivine, maybe. And this is a piece from Hawaii. This is called ropey lava, is what they call it. It's from the front of one of those lava flows that really slowly pushes along. And you can see the little bumps that were kind of folded up on itself as it was being pushed along. Yep, kind of like waves. All right, so next we're going to talk about scoria. Everybody grab your piece of scoria, labeled 10B. Can somebody tell me what color your scoria is? How, how would you describe it? What color? Yours is blackish brown. Can somebody who has a different color tell me what theirs looks like? Blackish? Okay, how about yours? Very dark brown, almost looks black. How about yours? Um, it's black with a touch of gray, and it has a lot of vesicles. Black with a touch of gray, lots of vesicles. That's a good little add-on. Okay, does anybody have one that looks reddish or maroonish? Raise your hand if you have one that's kind of reddish. Okay, awesome. So it can be blackish, it can be grayish, it can be reddish or maroonish. It can be lots of different colors. Um, but the most important feature that will help you identify it is the vesicles. It's pretty light, right? You can feel that it's, it's light. It might even float on water if you put it in, in a bowl of water. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your piece. So because of these vesicles, 
and the fact that you can't see any crystals in it, right? You can't see any crystals, I'm sure. Do you think it cooled above the ground or below the ground? Below. No, above. Above. It cooled above the ground. Does anybody have questions about Scoria? You found something that looks like a crystal in there. It probably isn't, but it could be. It might be. Sometimes a crystal can get trapped in that magma. Yeah. Okay, he asked a good question. Does scoria always have the little holes in it? Yes. Yes, if it doesn't have the little holes in it, it's not going to be scoria. Another question. How do the gas bubbles come? So the gas bubbles are from dissolved minerals, or dissolved gases, dissolved gases that were inside the magma. And when it came out of the earth, the bubbles were coming up. Just like when, if you shook up a pop and opened it up and you have all the foam and bubbles shooting out, imagine that was liquid rock and then it froze instantly. It turned solid instantly. So it's just like that. That's how it formed. One more question. Yours kind of looks like gold? Yeah, sometimes it, it, it can. It can have a number of different colors. Let me show you some pieces I brought. All of the pieces I brought are reddish colored. It's not always. Obviously, yours is more blackish usually. But... The point is, it's really light. And it's not whitish or light gray. You have one more question? How does it get its color? It gets its color from the minerals that are in it. Okay, so the next one that we're going to look at is pumice. It looks a lot like scoria, right? It's 9B. Can somebody tell me what color your pumice is? Gray. Yours is gray. How about yours? Gray. Anybody have one that's not gray? What color is yours? Brownish. Okay. But is it like a lightish brown? Okay. Gray and brown. Yours is whitish. Okay, that's a good one too. So pumice, it looks a lot like scoria and it forms very similarly. It's got all those bubbles in it. It's really lightweight, um, but it's almost always lighter. It's got a little bit of a different mineral structure to it, different mineral components. So it's usually a whitish or a grayish um, instead of a reddish or a brownish. Um, but it will always have lo lots of holes in it. Um, this is a fun picture here. You can see how big this rock is that this guy is holding. And he's picking it up with his hands. He couldn't, could never do that if it was a piece of granite. Um, but pumice is so light that he can pick up this huge sand. Do you have a, a question? Your rock is yellow. Yeah, sometimes that whitish and grayish almost looks yellowish. That's a good observation. Absolutely. What else? You have a question about why pumice looks close to scoria. Well, pumice and scoria are almost cousins. You can think of them as rock cousins. They form very similarly from similar volcanoes, and they have kind of a similar mineral composition, too. Um, so they're pretty close. The, the main way that you can tell the difference is the color. Just remember that pumice is the lighter color. Yes? What is its uses? That's a good question. Um, has anybody seen pumice used for anything maybe around the house? What, did, what have you seen? A foot scraper, right? They sell little bars of pumice at the drugstore for scraping off the tough parts on your feet. Anybody else seen a, a use for pumice? What else? Soap. soap. That's right. The lava soap that you see, it's got little pieces of ground up pumice in there. And when you use it, it grinds away the little sharp pieces and helps clean things. What else? Shampoo. Shampoo. I've never seen it, but it probably exists. What else? Any That's okay. We'll come back to you. One more. Make what? A sculpture? I've, 
I don't know, it'd be a tough one to carve, to be honest. I, you've seen it? Alright, she's seen it. Um, one other use that I've seen pumice used for is cleaning toilets and other pieces of porcelain. They'll sell big bars and you can scrape minerals off of, of pieces of porcelain with it. Um, I just want to bring light to this one picture as well. This is from an eruption, I believe in South America, and this pumice was actually blown into the ocean. And because it's so light and it floats on water, there were these pieces of pumice that floated for a year or better before they all sank or washed up. Um, and it, it messed up boats all over the place trying to go through this area with all this floating pumice on the ocean. Yeah? How come pumice is the only rock that can float? How come pumice is the only rock that can float? Well, it's not. Sometimes scoria will, too. Um, but it's really light. It's got all those air bubbles in it. So it's, it's pretty light. Way back there. Do rocks that cool below the ground always have crystals? That's a good question. And I would say pretty much always. Yeah, there's exceptions to everything, but yes. If, the, if you can see crystals in it, it probably cooled below the ground. Yes? Yours doesn't have bubbles? It should. That's not a real good one. Are they? Maybe they're really little. You might have to look really close to see the bubbles. All right, let me show you a couple pieces of pumice that I brought. Oops. Okay, so this one you can almost see some lines in it and there's lots of little holes. This one's a little darker. It's a medium gray instead of a light gray like the first one. This one's about the same color. It has a little bit bigger bubbles. Sometimes pumice will have giant holes and sometimes it'll have real small ones. It's very variable. All right, the next rock we're going to talk about is obsidian. So if you grab your piece of obsidian, it should be marked 8B. Can somebody tell me what color your obsidian is? What color? Black. Okay, can, does anybody have a piece of obsidian that they would say is not black? What color would you say it is? Grayish black. Is it pretty close to black, though? Pretty close. All right. Does anybody have a piece that's far away from black. It's not really black. What's yours look like? Yours is a light gray. Alright. Almost always obsidian is black. It doesn't have to be though. It doesn't have to be. But it is very often black. I would say most all the time. Obsidian has a nickname. They call it volcanic glass. Because it looks just like glass. You, you have to be careful with some of the pieces. They're almost sharp. You could cut yourself on them because they're like broken glass. And really, if you look at the minerals that obsidian is made out of, it's almost the same as the glass that we make. It's very similar. So think of obsidian as glassy. Do you guys think obsidian formed under the, under the ground or above the ground? Above the ground, that's right. Now it doesn't have any bubbles in it, like you might think it might. But it also doesn't have crystals, right? You can't see any crystals in there. If you can, it's rare to see anything inside there. Um, there is one more feature that I want to point out with obsidian. It's the way that it breaks. We don't usually talk about fracture with rocks. That's something that we talk more about with minerals, which we'll get into. But the way that obsidian breaks it breaks into these shell-like shapes, is, is kind of how we call them, these curved, wavy breaks. Does anybody know what that's called? What's it called? No, not cleavage. Another guess. Conchoidal fracture. That's exactly right. That's what we call it. So conchoidal fracture, almost always on a piece of obsidian, you'll be able to see a conchoidal fracture. Sometimes they're just little tiny ones. Sometimes it's really big across the whole sample. Um, but 
almost always, if it's broken, you will see a conchoidal fracture on there somewhere. So in the pictures here, I have the, the big picture up here is just regular obsidian. It's that black color. But this one, it's reddish. It's got reddish streaks through there. We call that mahogany obsidian. You don't need to remember that, but know that it's not always black. Sometimes it's greenish. Sometimes it's got little um, snowflakes in it, we call This is snowflake obsidian. Um, those are other minerals that are in there. Um, so it's not always black, but it's usually black. You have a question? Yours is half gray and half black. It can happen, because when it's melted glass, sometimes it doesn't always mix up good. So sometimes there's different areas that have more or less of certain types of minerals in it. Yeah? Uh, mine is 8B. It's not glassy. It's yellow. Huh. You'll have to show that to me afterwards. All right, let me show you some of the pieces I brought. This piece here has a really big conchoidal fracture on it. The whole broken surface is one big conchoidal fracture. The outside of it is weathered. Doesn't have any fracture that you can see. This one is snowflake obsidian. It has these little white things that look like snowflakes. Those are other minerals that didn't mix into the glass. This one is what we call a volcanic bomb. So this is actually a piece of, it was a piece of molten rock that was thrown out of a volcano and cooled in the air. So it's rounded on all the edges. Um, and at one point it was a piece of lava that was flying through the air, like you see sometimes on TV. Yeah. Are yeah. scoria and pumice also considered glass? Yes, scoria and pumice are a type of volcanic glass too, but they have holes in them. This is what they call an Apache tear. It's a, a small obsidian volcanic bomb, and it's actually in a really heavy rock that's kind of like pumice, but the holes on it are very small. Uh, it's a little different, but sort of. And this one, I don't know if you can see it, but it's rainbow obsidian. If you catch the light right, you can actually see rainbow colors in it. It's really pretty. So there's different colors that you can find obsidian in, but it's always going to be a dark material. And if it's broken, that broken face will be glassy and usually with a conchoidal fracture. Obsidian cooled outside of the earth and it won't have any bubbles in it. Okay, so next we're going to talk about granite. That's 7B. If you could grab your piece of granite. We'll deal with it afterwards, okay? It's okay. I'll just tell you the pretty right thing out of my knowledge of city. Okay. These are all yours. Mm -hmm. Can I use it down low? Thank you. Okay, so granite. Granite is an intrusive rock. Oh, thank you. Granite is an intrusive rock which of all the rocks that we've talked about is the first rock that you should actually be able to easily see the crystals in it. Can you guys see the crystals in your sample of granite? So there's areas that are different colors, meaning that each of those are different minerals that are put together to form the rock that we call granite. Can somebody tell me one of the colors that they see in their, in their granite? What color? Pink. Pink. Absolutely. Pink is a very common color, and that's feldspar that's in there. That's potassium feldspar. What color do you see in yours? Dark gray. That dark gray is usually quartz. That's another component that we always see in granite. What else? White. That could be a feldspar. That could be a quartz, depending on, on what type of white it looks like. Um, what else? Black. Black. That's the, another one I was looking for. So that's probably biotite mica. Okay, so 
Could be hornblende. Mica, quartz, and feldspar are the three minerals that you can always look for in granite. You should pretty much be able to always find those three. There's oftentimes other minerals too, but those are the ones that you look for. Yes? Gray. You see gray in yours. Absolutely. That could be it's probably quartz. Um, does anyone have bubbles in their sample? Any vesicles in their sample of granite? You do? It's very uncommon. It's very uncommon. You usually don't see bubbles inside quartz because it cools generally very deep inside of the earth. Um, Mount Rushmore was actually carved out of a giant piece of granite. Granite is great for sculptures. Carvers love making sculptures out of granite because it's very durable. It's weather resistant. Um, so because we can see those crystals, we call it phaneritic texture, right? There's no vesicles. It's felsic because it's light colored and it cooled inside the earth, so it's intrusive. Um, let me show you some of mine. Here's a piece of granite. It was formerly a countertop in someone's house. Um, oftentimes, you know, you, you see granite countertops in people's houses all the time, right? Very few of them are actually granite. They're usually a different rock. This one actually is granite. Um, and you can tell because it's got that pinkish and whitish crystals along with the grayish quartz and the black biotite, the mica. Um, so this is granite. Are, would you say the crystals in it? You can see them, so they're bigger than the other ones. But would you say that they're very large crystals or medium-sized? Medium. medium. I would say so, too. So it cooled slow enough for the crystals to form, but it didn't cool really, really slow. Um, on the other hand, take a look at this piece. So it's got huge crystals in here, giant pieces that cooled separate. So comparatively, this one cooled even slower than the first one because it, it allowed those crystals to grow very, very big. In fact, I've seen pictures of crystals that are bigger than me, single feldspar crystals inside a wall of granite. So things can sometimes cool extremely slow. There's a special term for that. They call it a pegmatite. You don't need to know that, but it's got a special name. Yes, way back there. I have there. one like that, but it's kind of smaller, but I have one like that. Cool. Go ahead. One sec. Say it again. Can granite be a dark peach? Yes, absolutely. There's a broad variety of colors that, that the feldspar component can have in granite. Sometimes it's almost pure white, sometimes it's orangish, sometimes it's pinkish, sometimes it's peachish. It can have a, a, a range of colors. They're all pretty light. They're all light colors. Um, nah, not so much on blue. Um, go ahead. The most common colors? Well, that pinkish or whitish or peachish, and then the black crystals and the gray ones. Yes? The granite is what? What about countertops? Um, well, what I was saying is that what people call granite countertops is often a different rock type. So there is sometimes granite, and then there's lots of other rocks that you almost need to be a, a petrologist to figure out which, what the name is of each of the different rock types. Petrologist is a, it's like a geologist that specializes in rocks. Um, so I have a couple other pieces I want to show you real quick. This one's kind of in the middle of the two that I showed you. It has some bigger crystals and some smaller ones. So it cooled at a medium-ish rate. 
And this one, they're pretty big, pretty big crystals, but not as big as in this giant piece. So you can kind of gauge how fast the granite cooled based on how big the crystals are. But it's, it's just a guessing game. Are they really big or not so big? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not the hardest rock. How can you tell granite from a rock that kind of looks like it? Well, the features that you look for in granite are those pinkish or whitish or peachish and then the little black crystals and the gray crystals. If it has those, we'll count it as granite. All right, so the next one I want to talk about is diorite. So that's one of the new ones for this year. I believe it's in the little sandwich baggie. Diorite, my nickname for it is the salt and pepper rock. It's black and white. Is it 15A? I don't think it's labeled. It's just in the little sandwich baggie with the three samples. It's one of the three. So it doesn't have a label, but it should be easy for you to identify. Yep, yeah, exactly. It looks a lot like granite, except without pink. It should be pretty black and white. So diorite and granite are very similar, right? They both have crystals that you can see with your naked eye. So where does that mean that the rock cooled? Where? Inside, right, it cooled underground, right? So both diorite and granite are intrusive. They cooled underground. And it's kind of in between that felsic and mafic. It's got some dark, it's got some light, it has minerals from both groups. So we call it intermediate. It's kind of in the middle. It shouldn't have any vesicles, much like granite. You know, it would be extremely rare for you to find a piece with a bubble in it. And the crystals are pretty easy to see. So it's got that phaneritic texture. Let me show you some pieces I brought. This has pretty small crystals compared to the granite pieces that we looked at, but you can still see them with your eye. You don't need a magnifying glass or a microscope to see them. Same with this one. And they're about 50-50 between the, white, the light colored minerals and the dark colored minerals. It's usually pretty even. Not always, but usually pretty even. Does anybody else have any more observations or questions about diorite? Yes. You gotta speak real loud for me. The first igneous rocks to be in existence. I'm not sure. Yeah. The uses are similar to granite, right? Um, since it's similar to granite, it's used for building stones, it's used for countertops, carvings, different things like that, because it's very weather resistant. Um, it's, it's very strong. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, you know, it's almost always either, it's almost always black and white. Way back there. What's the density? Well, we don't usually look at rocks in terms of densities. That's more of a feature that we look at for minerals. Because there's a range, sometimes it might be 40% the light ones and 60% dark ones, and that would have a different density than if it was reversed. So we don't usually think of it that way. <laughs> But it's definitely a lot heavier than the pumice and the scoria. Yeah. Is diorite always that smooth? No. No. The, the texture of it on the outside, it could be real rough or it could be smooth, depending on if it was broken or ground away or washed down a river and tumbled rounded. It could always have, it could have a different shape or a different smoothness. Yeah. It doesn't always have a flat edge. Just because your sample does, doesn't always. Yeah. The mineral composition, there's definitely some 
Feldspar is in there. I'm not really going to ask you too much about it. There's some other darker minerals as well. Depends. Yes. Could be mica. Yeah, there's definitely some mica in there. Yep. A lot of times when a rock weathers, one side might look different. Um, that, that does have a lot of effect on it. All right, we're going to move on to gabbro. Gabbro is the next one. So that should be probably the darkest rock in, your, in that sandwich bag. I know they're not labeled, but it should be dark. Could be. Yeah, the darkest rock in your sandwich bag. So can somebody tell me... you got to stay in your seat, bud. you got to stay in your seat. Just do your best to guess. Um, can somebody tell me what color you would say your sample of Gabbro is? What color? Black? Okay, does anybody have a color other than black they would use to describe it? Yeah. A greenish. That's a good observation. Greenish. Um, what else? What do you see? Brown. Okay, brownish. Another one. Yellowish, brownish. Okay. Um, so for the most part, it's going to be a very dark rock, right? Largely black, but if you look at it closer, it'll have hints of other colors. Usually greenish. Um, it could have a little bit of yellowish or brownish or other other colors, but it's generally pretty dark. Could even have some white specks or spots on it sometimes, or grayish specks, but for the most part, most of it is very dark. Can you tell me, can you see the crystals, each individual crystal in the rock? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So that means it cooled underground, right? It's got that phaneritic texture, because you can see those crystals. Shouldn't be any holes in it either, right? Just like the diorite and the granite, it's rare to have holes or vesicles because it cooled underground. So it'll be a darkish, blackish, or greenish rock with crystals. Now, I want to highlight the magma that created Gabbro, that liquid rock. If it were to have cooled very quickly, it would be another rock that we already talked about. If it was an extrusive rock. Does anybody have a guess as to what rock it would be? What rock? If it was extrusive, what, what rock would it be? The same magma, the same composition, cooled down separate. Yeah, go ahead. Basalt, that's exactly right. So it's got the same mix-up of minerals in it as basalt, except you can see the crystals in it because it cooled slowly. But that magma that was underground, that melted rock, was basically the same. So here's a piece that I brought. I would say it's a greenish black. It's, but you can see the crystals in it. They're pretty big. All right. Anybody have any questions for me? Way back there. What's your question? You gotta speak loud. How does it get its color? Its color is from the minerals that are in it. It has dark minerals that give it the dark color. Yeah. If it was extrusive. Yep. Yep. So, how come they have similar colors? He asked why, why basalt and gabbro have different colors um, if they're the same basic magma. And they oftentimes are a pretty similar color. Um, not all basalt and not all gabbro looks the same. They all are vary a little bit. But um, they're generally about the same colors because they're a, this, about the same mixture of minerals. One more question about Gabbro. Go ahead. Um, the easiest way to tell Gabbro apart from obsidian 
is the way that it breaks. They're both going to be dark colored, but the obsidian will have that conchoidal fracture and that glassy look to it. Whereas the gabbro, you can see crystals in it. All right, let's get on to the last rock we have here. Last one is rhyolite. So everybody grab, this should be the light colored one that was in your sandwich baggie. What color is your rhyolite? Somebody tell me what color you see. What color? Ash brown, like kind of grayish brown. Grayish brown. Anybody have something that's other than grayish brown? Yes. Peach? Peach, that's a good good one. Yeah, that's a good color. Rhyolite is often peachish. Another color. Sandy peach. All right, I'll buy that. What else? Ghost gray, all right. <laughs> what else? Um, it's like a very light gray, and a very um, light brown mixed together. A light gray and a light brown mixed together. That's an excellent observation. So sometimes with rhyolite, there will be different colors that look like they're swirled together in there. That happens sometimes. All right, let's talk about, give me one more color, somebody. Go ahead. Beige-ish. Okay, absolutely. So all of these colors we listed off are, are light colors, right? Rhyolite is almost always a light color because it's felsic. Now, can anybody see crystals in their sample? If you can, raise your hand. Okay, would you say the crystals are pretty small or not so small? Small. They're, they should be small or very small. Some samples you won't be able to see any crystals in. Sometimes you'll see a few small ones. It's uncommon to see bigger crystals in rhyolite. Does anybody have any bubbles in their sample? Raise your hand if you do. So a few people, right? Some people, but not too often, right? Sometimes you might see one or two bubbles here. Not like scoria, not like pumice, but it does happen. Sometimes you'll see it. Um, now, since the crystals are so small in rhyolite, do you think that it cooled outside of the earth or inside the earth? What do you think? Outside. outside, that's right. So it's extrusive. Okay. Let me show you a few pieces I brought. So this is what I think of as textbook rhyolite. It's a smooth, light pinkish or peachish color. If you look really close, maybe with a magnifying glass, you can see a few crystals here or there but not too many. And there's a few tiny bubbles, but they're very small and there's not too many of them. These pieces are pretty. They have some swirled up colors. They have some areas that are white or cream along with some yellows or oranges, oranges that kind of look mixed up. And this happens as that liquid rock kind of flows and swirls around and mixes together with different minerals that are inside of it. Now, just like I said that gabbro and basalt were similar magmas, one cooled outside and one cooled inside the earth, what rock do you think rhyolite is a cousin to or similar to if it were to have cooled under the earth? What rock might it be? It's one of the ones that we looked at. What do you think? Pumice? That's not a bad guess, but pumice cooled outside the ground too. So what if it cooled inside the ground? What do you think? Granite, that's right. So granite and rhyolite are cousins. They come from a very similar magma body. But the granite cooled slowly and was able to grow crystals underground. The rhyolite cooled quickly outside of the ground so it has small, few crystals. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up here today. I never expected this. This is the most exciting thing I ever saw. It taught us more about how rocks are formed, more minerals, and about how there was obsidian, gravel, a bunch of other kind of rocks.